irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is The Rob Black Show. Tech stocks have taken a $500 million beating in the last two weeks. The SEC is probing workplace issues at Activision. Jeff Bezos is updating his philanthropic efforts. He's in London right now, hobnobbing with Boris Johnson and his girlfriend, Lauren Sanchez. China continues to be in the news. The America pullback is happening on our stock markets right now. I'm okay with it. Yesterday, we had a steep, steep sell-off to the point where I was like, huh. It's interesting because I'm selling my home right now, an old home. The home my babies were born in. And it's not lost on me that I'm taking offers as the stock market's starting to correct. And could there be a correlation of a top? There could be. I don't really believe in talking about tops and bottoms and stuff like that. I think right now, if you've got five years, it's still a very investable market. If you have five months, watch out. If you have five minutes, uh uh-uh. It's all about time frame right now. Stocks are recovering today, but we've gone into the red after starting in the green big. So we're continuing the September slide. China's got a heavily indebted property called Evergrande, and they're in big trouble. About $300 billion of liabilities to banks and bondholders. And if the banks, okay, so let's say one bank lent them $100 billion. That bank has to have $3 trillion of assets to cover that $100 billion loan. Or do they need $3 million in assets? It's all about the leverage on the downside. On the upside, it's beautiful. On the downside, it, it like you have to start trimming. You have to start calling everything back to stop a run on the bank. So leverage works on the upside. You know that. You've owned a piece of real estate. You bought it for $500,000, but you only put $50,000 down. That's called leverage. And it's, it's beautiful when it's working out on the upside. And it's pretty horrible on the downside. Adobe is going to report earnings tonight. FedEx and AutoZone. Get in the zone. AutoZone. AutoZone teaches us a little bit about new cars versus used cars. Not a lot there. FedEx shows us businesses. Um, from my corporation, I've sent more stuff FedEx overnight than from my home. From my corporation, when I needed a signature absolutely positively must be done in the next 24 hours, it was always FedExed. Never from my home. I never go to the mailman and go, good mailman, please deliver this to my my family member's back on the East Coast overnight. I'm like, when it gets there, it gets there. If it's a Christmas card that's late, too bad. So FedEx shows us businesses. Adobe is one of my favorite stocks that I've never owned. And I, that got to piss me off in my grave. That may be my, my moment that I, I share on my deathbed that no one understands. I go, Adobe. I won't name a sled. I'll name a stock. That'll be my Citizen Kane moment. I know you're saying, did you just spoil Citizen Kane? I'm pretty sure if you haven't seen it in 80 plus years, you're not going to see it. So get off my back. One Chinese billionaire lost $27 billion in Beijing's tech crackdown. His personal wealth evaporated in what's been the worst loss of wealth of anyone in the world this year. You think you're having a bad year? Colin Huang, founder of Penduo Duo, has lost $27 billion this year. Bank of America sees similarities between the 20% pullback we saw in 2018 and the current market. Basically, weak earnings and a hawkish Fed that wants to raise interest rates led to the downturn that they quickly reversed and said, oops, we are sorry that we are raising interest rates. We'll cut that out. Will that happen again? kind of feel that it's kind of starting. I don't want to look at the markets because I don't want to tell you what I'm going to think I'm going to see. Should I look at the markets? Yes, look at the markets. Be a big boy. 
We started out a hundred up on all markets. We lost all that, but now we're back in the green by a skosh. Where we end the day is more telling as the September slide continue versus where we are an hour and a half into it. But yes, when we hit the red, some buyers stepped up and said, maybe it's just a short-term dip. So that's out there. A retirement expert is saying it's time to take some profits amidst a modest outlook. I would agree with that statement. Let's talk real big picture here for a second. I think if you have more than five years, it's time to look at buying stocks. I think if you're in retirement and you've had this amazing bull market through a pandemic, that as we're getting towards the state of the government's taking stimulus off the table, you need to go, are we better off than I thought we were going to be? And maybe in your in retirement, you rebalance a bit. It's two very different games. I believe most sports games are lost and not won. I think the team that commits the most turnovers loses. Hold on to the ball. Don't put it on the ground. You're probably going to do well. I know you're saying that's a broad statement, but I think wealth has two, two phases too, wealth creation and wealth preservation. This stock market means something totally different to someone who's trying to preserve wealth versus someone who's trying to create wealth. And with what we're seeing in volatility, 5% down so far, could it go to 20%? Yes. Now, here's the worry that I have for people in retirement. Let's say we get a 20%er, and then it doesn't snap back in six months where we're used to it, and people start making poor decisions. They start drawing on assets they didn't think they're going to have to draw on in retirement this early. That's why it's important to rebalance. That's why it's important to have a certified financial planner work with you. It's the it's the mistakes in retirement in nervous markets that, that have me more concerned than the mistakes in accumulating wealth when you're 30, 40, 50. Americans are going to rely on their 401ks rather than pensions. Pensions have become very rare. 401ks allow for a lot of growth. But once you hit 65, you got to start thinking about preserving wealth versus growing wealth, or you actually have to have a real good conversation with yourself about where you are. So that's the difference in the markets. Do you kind of agree with me? Do you pick up what I'm putting down? Johnson Johnson has announced their COVID-19 booster data and their kids trials have hit delays. Johnson & Johnson went, I got that shot. And you know what's funny? I've got a little bit of like, oh, I should have gotten the Pfizer Moderna one. Oh, I got the old-fashioned Johnson & Johnson one. So I've got a little personal shame going on with myself. But it, there's good news on Johnson Johnson. Just, they seem to be about two or three months behind the good news on Pfizer and Moderna. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Honest, straightforward, and right to the point. The Rob Black Show. Questions about how to invest in your retirement? Check out robblackshow.com and get in on the conversation. Subscribe to the podcast and video channels. No one cares more about your money than you do. It's time to start to feel good about your financial future. robblackshow.com robblackshow.com Markets are attempting a rebound sort of from yesterday, but it's so early. Yesterday was bloody awful. I'm glad that I live in a two-story house because let's just say I'm not jumping. But watch out below, right? <laughs> even even big old raw black jumping off uh, a balcony might might hurt. Uber's up 6% today after providing some pleasing gross bookings and adjusted EBITDA guidance. EBITDA guidance is kind of funky. What is EBITDA guidance? It's earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization. Got Johnson Johnson's hire today after saying a booster shot of its vaccine two months after the initial shot offered 94% protection. I'm seeing some numbers as high as 100% protection. That's just weird. Lennar is down 3%. They're a big home builder, super important company in the sense that it can help solve housing 
by flooding the market with supply, but it's not. They came up shy on third quarter expectations on account of ongoing supply chain issues, cost of materials, Royal Dutch Shell's selling its Permian assets to ConocoPhillips for $9.5 billion in cash. U.S. Bank Corp. is buying a union bank for approximately $8 billion in cash and stock. I kind of like it when we see mergers and acquisitions. It's Royal Dutch Shell, U.S. Bank Corp. saying, hey, we got this pretty daughter that we want to get married off. Does anyone have a cow for us? And ConocoPhillips says, here's... Uh, 9.5 billion cows. And U.S. Bank Corp. says, uh, we're, we're going to go up to you guys and join U.S. Bank Corp. because we'd be better. So here's $8 billion in cash for us. We'll take that. Thank you. The August housing starts and building permits report was stronger than expected. That's slightly positive. Total starts increased 3.9%. When we have permits... A permit is in true Desperate Housewives kind of fashion on ABC this weekend. A permit is a good-looking construction worker going into the city hall and saying, well, that old Mrs. on Hillbilly Lane just asked me to put in a new kitchen for her, so I'm going to bring a crew by and we're going to destroy her kitchen and we're going to go buy some new cabinets and put them in for her kitchen. So... The construction worker and his crew are going to get paid and the lumber companies are going to get paid and it's putting people to work. Permits are good on that level. And they also typically increase housing. Permits rose 6% on a seasonally adjusted basis. I'm Rob Black talking all things financial money, investing, and more. DraftKings is making a $20 billion offer for a UK sports betting company. I've never pulled the, t- uh, I've never bought DraftKings, but I want to. Um, I'll take a look at it this week again. Every time I take a look at it, I'm kind of, uh, I get close and I don't pull the trigger. But a $20 billion offer to buy a UK online sports betting company, Intain, offers largely in DraftKings stock. Intain jumped 15% on the London markets. It rejected an all-stock deal earlier this year from MGM Resorts for $11 billion. So DraftKings offers $20 billion. President Biden is addressing the United Nations General Assembly today. His decision to end the America's military mission in Afghanistan is the big addressee, but he's also going to discuss COVID pandemic, climate change, and challenges posed by China. He's trying to change the tone that President Trump had with the United Nations. Um, I talked about the United Nations yesterday with my son, and it's kind of interesting where you're trying to explain what the role is. It's Some things I'm really good at explaining, some things I've learned I am not. Google's buying a big New York office building for $2.1 billion. I used to look at small companies, not big companies. But when Google was in, we could say 20 years ago, we were a much smaller company. If they had done this deal, I'd say things are looking great for Google. Uh, But isn't Google the company that's still having employee problems, getting them to come back after COVID? And I'm like, $2.1 billion. So now I'm having a different tone. I'm having a different conversation with myself. But when smaller companies tend to buy or lease real estate, and you can typically find this in like business journals. Um, I know you've probably been at a restaurant before. There's all those free newspapers out in front. Sometimes it's like the San Mateo news. And you're like, I didn't know San Mateo had its own. And then you see most of the articles are, are Reuters. But there's like one or two articles by the employees of San Mateo news. And you're like, how are they making money? And they're getting a little advertising money. But there's not a lot of employees either. But those business journals are are really, really, really valuable for some insider kind of techniques for spotting companies' growth. You tend not to want more office space unless you're going to be increasing sales, right? Right. 
Ford has unveiled a new off-road Timberline. But here's the kicker. And this is where I, I think Elon Musk should be worried. So the Timberline model is this kind of nice looking SUV. It's kind of heavy duty looking. But it's going to be introducing driverless features. I know you're saying, wait, wait, a, a car that goes off-roading driverless? This sounds really bad. Um, it's going to be powered by Ford's 3.5 liter EcoBoost V6 engine. That produces 440 horsepower, 510 pounds of torque. That's a nice engine. It's a full-sized SUV. <clears throat> Ford loves it in large part because people pay a premium for SUVs in America. Let's just face it. If you watch one NFL game this weekend, we're getting fatter and fatter. We're big old Oompa Loompas. And to fit into a, a, a vehicle, we need kind of like the big SUVs. Ford introduced its blacked out stealth edition where it offers hands free highway driving. Ooh, hands free. Isn't Tesla the company that's still making cars that are crashing into other cars when it's self driving? Uh huh. That, see, that's the perception. The reality, you know, oof. Blue Cruise Systems is going to allow for hands-free driving on more than 130,000 miles of dedicated highways in North America. It controls the vehicle's speed and steering while also monitoring the driver's attentiveness through an infrared camera system. I like many of these features. I like where we're going with many of these features. But for now, I'm going to err on the side of caution. I'm going to get my Johnson Johnson booster shot on the side of caution. Pay attention, I'm driving. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube Rob Black Show. Have a question? Reach out at robblackshow.com. Robblackshow.com. So I would be wrong if I didn't tell you I'm a little bit nervous when I see a headline like Mitch McConnell says the GOP will vote to, for U.S. to default on its debt. That would be disastrous. If our credit rating gets knocked down again, we need to have the best credit in the world for the type of economy we run. When you have the best credit score in the world for the type of economy you run, you get the best rates in the world. And your ballooning deficit can be serviced by the economy. It's interesting times. The GOP have that situation that they're playing with. Democrats want to spend the money. GOP wants to default on the debt. I'm not saying who's right or wrong. Then now we're going to get Roe versus Wade up in front of the Supreme Court. There could be some drama in the United States down the road is what I'm lending my, my thought of the day to you as. 70% of millennials are living paycheck to paycheck. That's unacceptable. Just so you know. Because the millennials are getting older. Uh, what I would refer to as adulting and life staging. Hitting expensive life milestones and yet not peak earnings. It's interesting how that teeter-totter works. Ten years ago when I bought a home, it was a little more stressful than it is now. Servicing that debt, I was like, well, we should probably cut back on Christmas and, and holidays and uh, travel. Now I'm like, ah, I'm at peak earnings. I'm, a, I'm not buying expensive stuff anymore. 70% of the generation, the millennials, said they're living paycheck to paycheck. 54% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, but millennials have the biggest, how shall we say, I'm broke. That's what paycheck to paycheck means to me. When you're going, well, I, I, I should wait to go out till tomorrow because uh, that's when I get my paychecks are at. 40% of baby boomers and seniors said they live paycheck to paycheck, the least of any generation. Living paycheck to paycheck, it kind of reflects economic needs and wants. It 
because when you don't, you get to go above those needs and wants. Millennials who are turning ages 25 to 40 this year are struggling. And they're not setting up enough of a buffer, especially the older ones. In large part, the older millennials are starting families. They're taking on majority of the family big purchases now, like new homes, new vehicles. Due to the pandemic and two economic downdrafts, the older millennials' careers have been stunted a bit by economic opportunities. The millennials have faced economic challenge after economic challenge. They graduated into a dismal job market in 2008, the financial crisis. The lingering effects of the Great Recession, which sent unemployment over 10%. And the younger and the people of color suffered more. And then you see the soaring housing costs. And yeah, you you can get in, but you're not saving as much as, you know, I told you 10 years ago was difficult for me. 20 years ago was really difficult. I couldn't imagine pulling off what I needed to pull off now or living in this lifestyle, creating this a second time. I don't think the pandemic has helped anyone's career. I don't know. Is that a true statement? Have you risen to power? Or are you just seeing your company kind of like moving sideways? The reality of paycheck to paycheck lifestyle in the United States is pretty complex. Because like I said, I want you to be saving for retirement. It's interesting when I talk about living paycheck to paycheck, it kind of implies there's a level of responsibility going on and that you're not getting extra sources of income. I totally plan to financially support my children on some level. Um, I'm still figuring that out. I know some people are like, I brought you this earth. When you're 18, you're on your own. But. That's not my mentality. Um, It's a precarious life stage right now, living paycheck to paycheck as a millennial and making those decisions on, are you going to get into housing which feels overpriced? Are you going to settle down? Do you feel comfortable with the money coming in? And then that's really what the, the issue. And I think we kind of all start to settle down when we feel comfortable, like this is my mate, this is my spouse. And this is what I deserve. And you feel comfortable with that. You're not hitting too far above you. And you're not hitting too low below you. You're kind of hitting that level of, yeah, this is perfect for me. But then you have to start having decisions like, how comfortable am I having children? Or how comfortable am I having a mortgage with the love of my life? So no matter what you go through these processes, <clears throat> just from time and age, right? This week's going to be an interesting week, what's left of it. We're going to learn a little bit more about Evergrande's chairman and Evergrande's debt issues. Chinese social media users are in an uproar right now, thinking that the CEO is delusional and accusing him of cheating employees out of money. Anytime a bank or a financial institution fails, it's, it's impressive. Have you ever seen a hotel in Vegas just get blown up and collapsed? You're like, whoa. That's what happens to real estate developers. The CEO said the real estate developer is going to wa- soon walk out of the darkness. That's kind of an interesting statement. Chinese state-linked financial news outlet National Business Daily posted the letter on Weibo. Within 30 minutes of posting, Evergrande became a trending topic on social media with over 100,000 comments. The company is on the verge of collapse. They have over $305 billion in liabilities. And the CEO is talking about walking out of the darkness. They're paying off their debt, not with cash, but with real estate right now. That's going to end very, very badly if the Chinese government doesn't come in and say, here's a, a check. 
a lot of people in hindsight go, the United States, we've seen this with GM and Ford getting bailed out numerous times in our lifetime. And our government is like, well, we're going to give them a loan and they're going to pay us wet back way more than we gave them a loan for. So we actually made money bailing out companies like GM. But we're not, not clean either. We can't go, oh, look what China's doing. They shouldn't bail out their own companies. They should like they should let them fail. On some level, GM and Ford should have failed. And someone like Tesla, who is, you know, figuring it out, didn't get the bailout. Toyota, who didn't get into the leverage situations with their unions and with their their contracts. They didn't have as many problems. So competition can kind of kill the companies that are delusional or stupid in their planning. But if governments bail them out, I just want governments to make money when they bail out an industry. That's, that's all I'm asking. Because then you're asking the company to take on some of the pain that they brought on to the situation. I know. It's a complicated issue, right? Let's take a look at the market numbers because we're now a good hour into trading. Yesterday was bad, and we kind of are putting the building blocks of a correction together. Correction being down 5, 10, 15, 20% from all-time highs. It's very common. And when it happened, it feels like it's, it's rare. Corrections are normal and healthy. Keeping your collective mind together during them is a little more difficult. The amount of times I've come on the air this year and said we're at an all-time high, it feels like it's been more than any period of time in my, my career, my 20-plus years of career doing this. So for me to say, yeah, yesterday we got down to a 5%, 200-day moving average correction in a lot of sectors, even if we don't get it. Even if it doesn't hold, even if we're back to all-time highs tomorrow, we're scaring some people out now. We're making people make decisions. You're seeing a pullback, so there are some selling. I've got a son with a beautiful head of hair. Like, it is crazy. I may post a picture of it on Facebook today because it is the stock market. He just got a haircut, and the lady feathered it really, really nicely. Um... She took off like maybe 1% of his hair um, so that it can continue to grow. That's what corrections in the stock market do. It's like getting a trim. Now, a 5% correction feels a lot worse than a 1%, but you are getting it healthier by getting some people selling at highs, booking a profit. I'm not against corrections. I actually kind of like them. Get in a 20% haircut, you're like, ooh, I look different. But it's also gives you a chance to roar back. I'm Rob Black, talking all things financial. Find me at robblackshow.com. Irreverent, over the top, and smart as a whip. This is the Rob Black Show. A personal financial plan with custom investment advice. That's why Rob Black has partnered with EP Wealth Advisors. With over $12 billion in assets under management and more than 80 financial professionals at the helm, EP services were built with you in mind. How can they help you? Find out at robblackshow.com, robblackshow.com. So I get a lot of research sent to me. And a couple things that I got my attention in the last 24 hours was this fantastic photo from 1918 where it's a police officer wearing a flu mask. And again, that's, it was called a flu mask. And it really looks like um, a burlap sack wrapped up three or four times. It's not looking like it's got the weaving that would be proper or assumed proper, which is why cloth masks aren't considered acceptable. Um, But what's cool about it is I I love old-time photos like that. So the story that adjoined that 1918 picture Talks about how COVID-19 has officially killed more Americans than the 1918 flu. Now, you can get into statistics and go, oh, we have a larger population. Totally, totally acceptable type of analysis. But you could also look into the analysis and say, we've got a lot more modern medicine. We're not wearing burlap sacks as masks. 
There's differences between the current pandemic and the 1918. The population in 1918 was one third the size it is now, meaning the H1N1 virus took a toll on a larger percentage of the population then. Uh, the H1N1 is taken on a large percentage now. So when I tell you Mississippi is one in 350 people have died of COVID and then the overall U.S. population is one in 500, that's a pretty big number for me. The CDC estimated about one third of the world's population in 1918 contracted influenza and at least 50 million people died worldwide. So far, COVID-19 has killed 4.7 million people worldwide. So the numbers don't really quite add up, except for in the United States. We've done a very poor job. President Joe Biden has laid out a sweeping plan to get two-thirds of the country's workers vaccinated. Roughly three-quarters of Americans have had at least one shot of the vaccine and are half are fully vaccinated leaving one quarter of Americans unvaccinated is a now a viral attack on the unvaccinated. Changing topics. Verizon expects a big year for 5G. My old dilapidated Apple phone, <laughs> it's cracked and it's, it's, I don't have tape on it, but pretty much so everything but tape at this point in time because duct tape could fix anything. But Verizon has emphasized the company's networking first strategy. Blah, 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 right? Its closest rivals, AT&T and T-Mobile. 5G adjacent services. They call it the five vectors where you're going to like blah, 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 blah. But 5G adoption by both businesses and consumers. You'll see new products like fixed wireless access broadband. That would mean more content producers like Disney can try to figure out how to monetize with wholesale agreements. A couple years ago, not even a couple years ago, many years ago at this point, come on, who am I kidding? Disney thought they were going to get into cell phones. And as a dad who had kids who were like Disney age, you know, that four to six is that magical time for Disney to manipulate your children into spending lots of money. There was a Disney phone that could like put a perimeter on where the phone could be used. And if your child ever leaves that perimeter, you would get an emergency 911 alert. Interesting. But why didn't it catch on? Because they weren't Verizon. Sometimes you need to stay in your own lane. Verizon's lifted its 2021 wireless service revenue. What they earn from mobile phone plans, uh, subscriptions, they're targeting about 35 to 4% margins. Not very much. But we roll on. It's interesting to think. Um, I just added a watch phone to my family's plan for my eldest son. That's the starter phone at this point in time. And it was funny because I was sitting there last second, like stripping off all the apps that would be distractions to him in school. I'm like, there has to be an easier way. And then I was like, I didn't have a, I didn't have a watch that could do a Dick Tracy phone call when I was his age. I turned out, I turned out okay. This is what I like to say. I'm good. Um, 800-516-1220 to get your calls on the air. Anything that you want to talk about, we can talk about money, investing, and more. Uh, stocks are aiming for a rebound today. But we opened encouragingly up 100. And now we're in the red. So the correction continues. The pullback continues. I like pullbacks. I cannot lie. You remember the bad rap song? I like big butts. Cannot lie. Um, so the NASDAQ just hit the red. The Dow hit the red. The SP 500 hit the red. September sucks. We're, we're good with that. I'm going to print a shirt. September sucked. And all I got was a stupid t-shirt. Anyone wants one? Contact me at Rob Black Show. 
if we get back to growth in October, we'll be like stoked. If we take the rest of the year off and we end up 10% up in all the indices, I think it's a winner, winner, chicken dinner. So right now we're up about 16 to 18%, maybe 15 to 16% most in markets in the United States. Because of yesterday's route and where are we going today? We're okay. We can do a little Kimba ya and do a group hug if anyone wants to meet me today. You can find me online at Rob Black Show, Twitter Rob Black Show, YouTube at Rob Black Show. Find us at robblackshow.com. Robblackshow.com.